Our first speaker this evening is Dr. Sarah Dakin um, from the College of Nursing at the University of New Mexico. She is the pre-licensure BSN program director. Welcome, Dr. Dakin. Before you joined the College of Nursing in 2020, Dr. Dakin worked in pediatric emergency department at UNM Hospital for over 20 years. During her time as a nurse, which has been over 30 years, she has had many interests in the areas of practice, including SANE nursing, case management, and emergency preparedness. Dr. Dakins has presented locally and nationally on various subjects and topics, including emergency preparedness, emergency pediatrics, and rural pediatric healthcare. <clears throat> Her doctoral quality improvement project looked at increasing nursing confidence to care for pediatric patients in rural communities using telehealth. Aside from teaching, she also has a passion for pediatric patient safety. She has been a child passenger safety technician for over 10 years. She continues to work with New Mexico EMSC Child Ready, <coughs> excuse me, my allergies, Child Ready Program, providing education and support to nurses throughout the state to improve pediatric care. I'd like to turn the mic and the presentation over to Dr. Dakin. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, okay. Um, are you sharing my screen or am I going to, oh, there it is. Can you see my slide presentation? Yes, ma'am. Perfect, thank you. Well, welcome everybody. Um, and I hope by the end of this, uh, you will be as passionate about preparedness and pediatric care as I am, or at least have a little interest that you want to investigate a little more. So the learning outcomes that we are, that I'm really gonna be looking at is how can you use technology to support decision-making in rural communities? And you know specifically, why is that important um, for New Mexico and our rural pediatric trauma patients? So, I'm going to address why, why in particular New Mexico has a problem, what do we have to offer, um, and how we're, we're presenting that. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, education and mock codes, the ECHO program that we have. Um, VPED is Virtual Pediatric Emergency Department. And then, of course, looking at some of our excess, uh, successes, barriers, and hopefully where we're going to go from here. So New Mexico, I think everybody on, on this call realizes New Mexico is a very rural state, but when you start looking at these numbers and how far some of our patients have to travel to receive care um, in an urban setting, for example, UNMH being the level one trauma center, you know, Northern Navajo, to over 200 miles, that is a ridiculous distance when you have a critically ill patient or child. Um, and the program I work with in Ch Child Ready and the telehealth program really has looked at ways we can improve pediatric outcomes. Um, and the program has changed and evolved over time. Um, as Dr. Kelly mentioned, my initial um, dipping my toe into this area was looking at how I could support um, rural nurses to care for these pediatric patients when they presented into an ER because pediatrics is very much one of those, often it's just a sniffle or a cough or a cold, but then every so often it is a critically ill patient. And you know these rural nurses, they have the knowledge, but they haven't used it in so long, they lack that confidence to, to move forward. So the idea behind the program was to provide extra education and support so that they would then feel confident with those patients. And hopefully over time, with that increasing con uh, confidence, reduce the number of transports um, from rural communities into the urban setting. When you look at those transports, there's 
not only the risk of injury because you're you're on the road or flying helicopters and we've all seen in the news recently the number of helicopter crashes um, with medical transports um, there are just as many ambulances that get into accidents and the time as well so if you can keep families together in their community safely providing optimal care um, it's cheaper, you don't have those transport costs, and it's also safer for the patient and everybody involved. So what is Child Ready? Child Ready has a number of facets to it. Um, we are, at the moment, our big part is the CREST grant with through HRSA, which is the Child Ready Rural Emergency Support of Trauma. Um, but that piggybacks onto a program that we've had for a couple of years now, our virtual pediatric emergency department through the telehealth network. Um, and this, they, they work in tandem at this point. The virtual pediatric emergency room offers real time, in the moment consults, not only to physicians, but nurses in the pediatric emergency room at UNMH. So they can call up and video conference with these communities um, and co-manage the care with these patients. So that you know, if it's someone that they're not comfortable with the medication dosing or specific medications because it is a pediatric patient, they have that second person they can talk to. The nurses can consult with the nurses in the pediatric emergency room to see, you know, how, how would they move forward? How would they help maybe restrain a child to start an IV or something like that? But something that they know how to do, but they haven't put into practice in a while. And they just need that extra, yes, you're doing the right thing, back up and support. Um, we have now moved that beyond just that virtual uh, emergency to this uh, CREST program, where we are looking at emergency preparedness and trauma preparedness in the rural communities and again how can we support these communities to stabilize patients prior to transport because the transport times looking at those distances can be quite significant um, in trauma they talk a lot about the golden hour well if you're 200 miles away from the nearest level one facility a golden hour is not even something realistic. You really are looking at maybe six or seven hours for some of these patients um, when you're coming from like a rural reservation where they're actually even having to travel for an hour or more in the back of a truck to get to a rural facility. So trying to get the optimal care to these rural communities is what we're aiming for. So some of the areas that we have really focused on is pediatric readiness. Um, there is the EMSC, so Emergency Services for Children, has a pediatric readiness project, which looks at how some of the communities and facilities are prepared to care for a child. And it's everything from something as simple as, do you have the right suction catheters, you know, the right um, SAP probe for the to be able to check oxygen saturation to bigger things like do you have a ventilator that can ventilate a child so looking broadly not just for equipment but also education so we have been working on that and providing education we started by doing one-on-one -on -one education which is what I was doing when I did my quality improvement program for my doctorate but now we've moved it Beyond that, and we're now doing echoes once a month, um, and we're doing virtual mock codes using a great program that actually gives the facilities a monitor that they can view and sound of the child breathing um, and parents panicking in the background so that they can work through these um, scenarios to gain that confidence so that you go back to a little more of muscle memory, which you have with those patients that you see all the time. We also do offer case review one-on-one um, -on -one with facilities when they've transported a patient and, you know, they want to know how they did, what they could have done to improve things, you know, or is there something they could have done to maybe stabilize the child prior to transport, which would have made everybody feel a little more comfortable. Um, so it's a great program that we can 
we can actually do that. Now, I will say one of our biggest successes right now is Northern Navajo Medical Center, which is out past Shiprock. Um, we initially started working with them and we were offering the one-on-one -on -one education. And then with their Child Ready score in 20, I want to say 2017, uh, their score was actually only 65%, so quite low. And we worked with them. We had monthly meetings. They would address one thing on their list that they hadn't got. Sometimes it's something as simple as a policy um, on how to suction a child, um, which is easy. You know, we're in a, an academic center. We have access to all of those things. And we, we, we facilitated adjusting those policies to their facility so that they could meet, meet the requirements. We then worked again with them doing mock codes, the education. We went up there and worked one-on-one -on -one with them. Um, and it has been an amazing collaboration. And we've now actually got their readiness score up into the mid 90%. So an almost perfect score. Uh, we've had some great trans patients that A, have been transported. We've supported the facility to stabilize the child prior to transport. And then we've also had patients that they've collaborated with and we have not transported. So over the last, I think it's nine years, we have calculated out, we've saved over $2 million in transport costs with patients that we have managed to support in rural communities, staying with their families. Um, my end of it, the education part, um, when you look at the cost of education for some of these rural communities, the nurses having to leave the community for a day or two to just come down for a one day conference, offering the echoes and the one on one education has saved the community, the nurses and the facilities, thousands of dollars. Um, so it's, it's a really exciting collaboration when you start working with these facilities. Um, and we are, with our ECHOs, we've now even gone beyond New Mexico. Um, we have a large group of nurses that on our monthly ECHOs are from Chicago. And we now have people internationally, our last uh, Echo, we had people from Spain and Italy. So it's really quite exciting that we're managing to get the word out and supporting this pediatric readiness because, you know, we're not going to be able to transport children to urban centers every time for every last little thing because these urban centers are overwhelmed. And by supporting rural communities, we're keeping not only the patients and the family, but the, the knowledge and experience in those communities as well. So like I said, currently we have saved over 2 million in transport costs. Um, the monthly echoes are significantly increasing confidence. Um, and the facilities that we have worked with um, we have documented increased nursing confidence to identify a sick, pa a sick pediatric patient and how to initially init sorry, initiate treatment and care, um, either to, like I said, to either keep them in the community or transport them. But having that confidence to say, yes, this is a sick child, um, you know, is, is huge because they then feel comfortable going to their physicians or their peers to say, I need help, this child is sick, and knowing that they're making that right decision and not second guessing themselves. So there have been several barriers. Um, engagement of rural communities is hard. A lot of our rural communities are IHS um, and they want to participate, but going through all of the paperwork and the red tape that comes with an IHS site has delayed some of our participation. Currently, the time and knowledge it takes, a lot of providers because of COVID are very burnt out. What we're seeing is 
you know, it's one more thing. Yes, it will improve outcomes. Yes, it will support them in their practice, but it's one new thing to learn. It's one new thing to on, on their plate. And we all know that that can be overwhelming at times. One of the other problems we've had because of COVID is the turnover of physicians and nurses in some of these communities. And I think we've all seen that in our practice at the moment. Um, they're burnt out, they don't want to stay anymore. They either quit practice altogether or change facilities. Um, so the knowledge that the equipment is available or this resource is available um, goes with those people as they move facilities. Um, we have had some issues with technology, and this was not something I had thought about until I started working with the Child Ready program, is that some of our communities in New Mexico are beyond rural and are actually frontier and do not have internet. They don't have cell phone access. And we have encountered that in a number of places that we have gone down We've met with the leadership. We've talked about what we can offer. They've got really excited. And then we realize that it's landlines and, you know, hardline Wi-Fi. There's no Wi-Fi um, and it's dial-up internet, which makes it really hard to um, utilize some of the technology that we offer because the, the speeds are not fast enough to do video conferencing to be able to visualize the children and things like that. Now, the future, we are definitely continuing our echoes. They are amazing. Um, have any, if you have not participated in an echo, we do about 20 minutes of education followed by usually a case study and discussion. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's very interactive, not just an election. We've got past that sage on the stage mentality. We try and get interactions from the, the, the crowd. Um, as technology improves, we are seeing the changes, the ability to help some of these communities a little more. We do have new contracts with some facilities around New Mexico, which I'm very excited about. And it is just wonderful to see how we are improving the outcomes for New Mexico children. And as mentioned, the idea, you know, what we've done in Northern Navajo, getting their child ready scores up is gonna be huge in the future. This is something that really does make a facility stand out that they can support pediatrics. Both the um, Emergency Nurses Association and the Academy of Emergency Nurse, uh, uh, the Academy of Emergency Medicine, really identify that having an improved pediatric readiness score supports pediatric outcomes. Um, the, the decrease in morbidity and mo mortality with that increased peds readiness score is significant. And we really want to make a difference in New Mexico with this program. Um, I know we will be doing uh, questions at the end, but I do want to tell you all that we have our next ECHO on April 21st at 8 a.m. And it is for the management of acute agitation in children and adolescents, which the more we are seeing so much mental health issues, I think this is going to be a, a big one and should be a great interaction. If anybody is interested, please email me and I can forward you the flyer and the QR code for registration. Thank you, Dr. Dakin. We sure appreciate your knowledge and sharing that with us. Um, we're actually going to do question and answer for your presentation at this point. Oh. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Marlena Bermel and I am the Marketing Alumni and Outreach Officer for the College of Nursing. You can write your questions in the chat and I'll read them to our presenter, or you may also virtually raise your hand and I can call on you and we'll alternate between the two and do our best to answer as many questions as we can. So um, for those of you at the end of our uh, presentation, we will po put both of our presenters emails in the chat so that you can email them um, after the presentation. So just so that everyone knows that. Um, we have a question here. What is the golden hour? 
So there is a lot of research that with uh, trauma patients, if they receive care within one hour, they're much higher incidence of a positive outcome. Morbidity and mortality is significantly reduced. Um, they're less likely to enter into a shock state if they've received fluids, blood, and other medications they may need, as well as if it's a sepsis, you know, the, the risk of sepsis, they'll get antibiotics. So just the, the ability to receive um, medical treatment within an hour. Um, unfortunately, New Mexico falls very short on that purely because of the size of New Mexico, the, how rural many of our facilities are, and how far a lot of our patients have to travel to even get to a rural facility. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Jacob? Well, before we move on, I just want to remind, oh, we do have one more. How does insurance fit in? So currently it is covered by the HRSA grant that we are working on. Um, I will say COVID has been a great thing because prior to COVID, insurance companies did not want to even consider telehealth as an option. But with COVID, they are definitely looking at it a little more, um, you know, during the height of COVID, it was something that was acceptable. So we now have that in and we are, work, as a program, we are working with insurance companies and um, billing to get it covered. It is a struggle because, you know, the insurance companies want somebody up front right there, which is a little hard at times. Um, but as it has been shown to be a, a viable option during COVID, I think we will have, we've gained some traction in getting that covered. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, um, we have another one. Decrease in cost by transportation was mentioned. Is this due to identifying issues earlier and able to prevent needed emergency intervention or simply access to expertise to manage the case? I, I would say case by case. Um, in my references, there is actually a case study that, we, that was published that we used, but I will say a lot of it is um, avoidable transports and we say avoidable versus unnecessary because if a provider is uncomfortable caring for a patient then it it was needed so by saying avoidable if we can support a child in the community safely so a large number of them were were th those type of avoidable transports quite often a patient by the time they get transported um you know, they're either better or the, by the time the family get to us, we've done whatever needs to be done and they're ready to go home. Or, um, it doesn't always work. So not everything is an avoidable transport. A lot of rural facilities do not have CT scan availability or someone to read an MRI, that type of thing. So those, those are still needed transports and we can um, facilitate the transport. We can facilitate stabilization prior to coming and even medications if needed and helping physicians and nurses with the dosing. But a big part of it, I think, is that confidence to say, okay, I can keep this patient here. We can watch them. I can keep making those, you know, video chats. They can, everybody can see how the patient's doing. And sometimes it does change. Sometimes it's a case of, okay, they were doing great, but now they're starting to deteriorate. We will do the transport now, but it's it's not in a panic. It's a much more controlled environment. And I think, especially in the pediatric population, that makes everybody feel a little more comfortable. Then we have a follow-up question. I would think that Medicaid would be enthusiastic not to pay for transport costs. Is this project collaborating with New Mexico DOH and Medicaid? 
Um, I believe we are. Yes, I am not on that side of it. <laughs> um, I get to I get to hear some of the discussions, um, but yes, the the problem is a, a big part of the problem is the credentialing in the facilities. Um, that is also an issue. We have to have our physicians credentialed in the facilities, um, and as I mentioned, IHS has a lot of red tape along that aspect of things. <laughs> Another question, is there specific training available to prepare the nurses and the physicians in telemedicine assessment? So when we come in and you, you actually participate in our program, then yes, we come out and we will help you. Um, some of our outline facilities even have otoscopes that attach so that we can also see what you're seeing. Um, but yes, we'll if we get contracted in with you, then yes, we come and we train you how to use the equipment and how to best describe and, you know, so that we can support you from a distance. What is the National Pediatric Readiness Project? It is through EMSC, so Emergency Medical Services for Children. And the project, um, it's a checklist and it's quite a lengthy checklist for facilities to be able to see how, how ready are they to care for pediatrics in their community? Um, and like I was saying, it's it's not just, you know, do you have a 3.0 ET tube? It's down to what education have you had? Do you have policies? Um, do you have guidelines on how to treat certain patients, uh, provide certain medications? Um, and how are you going to transport patients out safely? Um, it is a great project. If I can make sure, if anyone's interested, I can also email you details on that and the checklist. And again, we are happy to support some of our rural or even urban facilities in making sure that they can score really highly in this because it's a great thing to be able to support our pediatric patients and know that we're we're prepared for that. Any other questions? Okay, I think I think that's it. Thank you, Dr. Dakin. I, I appreciate you. your expertise. Thank you so much. I want to take this opportunity to remind those of you who may have come in a little late to please sign in with your name and your credentials in the chat so that we have them recorded for CE purposes. Okay, we will move on to our next speaker. So I would now like to introduce to you our second speaker, UNM College of Nursing lecturer, Ms. Geraldine Guerra Sandoval. Ms. Guerra Sandoval's nursing career began at UNM Hospital. After completing a nurse residency, she became a staff nurse and then a unit-based educator. Ms. Guerra Sandoval teaches level one nursing students at the College of Nursing. She has received several honors, including the Distinguished Nurse and DAISY Team Awards. She conducted a study in a medical surgical unit to address the language barriers of limited English proficient LEP patients. The study significantly improved the communication needs of the LEP patients, and the findings have been shared at several nursing conferences. She has worked on several projects to promote safety and quality care at UNM Hospital. She is, a cert she is certified in the medical surgical nursing specialty. I'll now turn it over to you, Ms. Guerra Sandoval. Hi, everybody. I usually go by Jerry Sandoval, so <laughs> my name is super long. So um, <laughs> anyways, thank you guys for joining us this evening. And um, I am going to share my screen now. Let's see. And scroll this over here. Okay, so um, the topic that I'm going to discuss is the effects of wearing PPE on communication between nurses, nursing students, and patients. 
This research project was conducted here at the UNM College of Nursing. And I just wanted to clarify something. Um, when I'm talking about uh, nurses, these are nurses that are enrolled in the RN2 BSN program or any other advanced nursing programs. So when we sent out the survey, we, we sent it out to all the um, nursing students at UNM because it gets a little confusing. I get a lot of questions about like which nurses so they're nurses that are in, in, our, in our nursing program. Um, so the purpose of the study was to investigate if nurses and nursing students were aware of their communication manner while wearing PPE. Um, I just wanted to share one more thing about me. So I teach in level one, level two, I teach didactic and I teach lab and clinical too. So when COVID came by, it was terrible, right? Everybody was um, very stressed out. And um, when it first started, we were not taking students to the clinical setting. Um, it was all virtual. But when we started bringing students back into the lab, I, uh, you know, we were going in staggered into the lab. That way we don't touch anything. We're not by anybody. Uh, we were wearing full PPE. So we were wearing uh, surgical mask, we were wearing N95s, we were, some people were wearing goggles and also the face shield. So I realized that it was like very, very hard for me to communicate with my patients because, I mean, I'm sorry, my students, because we were also like six feet away. Some of them were a little farther. They were, um, they had to be in a certain spot in lab. They could not move from there. They had their assigned bed and their assigned mannequin. So it was really difficult to, to um, communicate with the students. So then I thought, well, you know, I wonder what's hap happening at the hospital. If we can't communicate properly here, you know, what's going on over there? Okay, so what is communication? So communication is defined as transferring of thoughts and information. So communication can happen in several ways. It can happen verbally, non-verbally. It can be written and also visual. Uh, verbal communication is using speech. So, you know, like right now I am talking to you guys, I'm communicating with you guys. Uh, but um, we also have non-verbal communication, which is gestures. Um, you use your facial expressions. You can use your hands to thumbs up, thumbs down, or, oh, I don't wanna talk to you. So that's nonverbal communication. And then um, we also communicate with patients when we give them like discharge instructions. So, so that's written communication, or we can even give them like infographics. So that's, you know, including pictures. So these are the ways we communicate with our patients and with everybody. So why is communication important for nurses? Communication is very important in the healthcare field and, and not just for nurses, but everybody that works in the healthcare field, but especially for nurses, because we're always in front of the patient at all times. We're the ones that are there continuously taking care of them, um, communicating information, what the doctor said or things like that. So we're always at the, at the forefront and we know the patients more than anybody in the healthcare field, like nurses and patients are like this. <laughs> We're close because we spend so much time with them. Um, but in order for us to communicate with our patients effectively, we need to um, make sure that, that we are um, dealing with the patient's emotions. If the patient is not feeling well or is depressed or is, cognitively uh, declining, then we cannot really communicate with our patients because they're not gonna take that information. Um, we have to make sure that we assess our patients. What are their communication needs? How do they like to communicate? Um, are they non-English speakers? Are they hard of hearing? So all of these things we have to consider when we're talking to our patients. We have to listen to them. Um, listening is also part of communication. When we listen to our patients, you know, you're paying attention to verbal and nonverbal cues. So we have to listen um, and we have to pay attention to what they're doing with their nonverbal cues. 
we have to try to understand their situation also, because this also affects communication. Are they taking in the information? Um, and then touch is also part of uh, communicating. When you put a hand over your patient's hand, what does that say to them? That says that you care for them, that you're gonna take care of them, and that you have compassion, and they feel more comfortable with you. Um, and one very, very important thing about communicating with your patients is that we have to check for understanding. Are our patients understanding what we are telling them? Okay, so what happens when we wear PPE? Uh, when we wear PPE, it totally uh, makes a big mess of communication because it hides nonverbal communication, it hides emotions, it hides, um, it prevents lip reading. So some patients that are hard of hearing um, rely on your, on your lips to, um, so that they can understand what you're saying. But if we're wearing PPE, we're covering all that up. But we needed to wear PPE, right? We needed to wear all that stuff because we don't, we didn't want to spread COVID around. So, and when COVID started, there was a lot of like misinformation and there was a lot of things that we didn't know. And there was a lot of like changes in the hospital. You know, they would, they would tell the nurses one thing and then the, the next week it was another thing. So it was very stressful. Um, and, uh, you know, wearing PPE when COVID was around was really bad because you have to wear the surgical mask the N95, the shields and everything. Um, one, one thing that I forgot to mention earlier is that, you know, 80% of communication is nonverbal. So just think about how much communication you are missing when you're covering up your face and, and not showing your um, nonverbal communication. Um, wearing PPE also, um, you can't hear when you're uh, you have all that PPE. The patients can't hear you. Um, it hides your facial expressions. And um, sometimes when you're talking to your patient with PPE, sometimes they might misunderstand what you're saying. So you tell them to take, um, I don't know, two pills and they take one instead because they thought they heard something else. Um, one more thing. When you're wearing PPE, when you're wearing goggles and or if you're wearing a shield, uh, sometimes your glasses can fog up and you can't make eye contact. Or sometimes the shield um, with a light, there's a reflection and you can't really like tell if your patient's eyes are open or closed or what they are doing. <clears throat> but um, we know that COVID has decreased significantly. But you know we are still required to wear a surgical mask in healthcare settings, so we still have to you know wear the mask. And for certain conditions, we still have to wear PPE uh, for certain airborne diseases. And also, um, if you if you're going to do a procedure with your patient that is going to um, airlize, that's a hard word for me to say, airlize. <laughs> um, if it's going to airlize their secretions, then we have to wear all that, um, you know, cover our faces really good with um, shields and goggles and N95s and stuff like that. Okay, so I made a little video and um, this is going to be kind of like a demonstration. And so I want you, I want everybody to put their speakers at normal hearing level for you. And um, a lot of times we put up the volume when we're like multitasking, right? So that we can hear what the other person is saying in Zoom. So just put it at a, a, a normal hearing level for you. And then we're going to do a little bit of a role play. So I want everybody in here to pretend that you're a patient. We're going to put ourselves in the shoes of a patient in a Metzer unit. So you were admitted to the hospital because you had a bad cough and a fever. So the nurse comes in to do a quick assessment before the morning med pass. After, I, um, after we view the video, we're just gonna have a little bit of a reflection and a little bit of a tiny discussion here. So let me see if I can play this video. Good morning, hello, how are you? My name is Jerry Sandoval. I'm gonna be your nurse today. 
So I just wanted to come and say a quick hello before I went to gather your medications for this morning. Um, I'm also going to be doing a um, nasal swab because you've been having a lot of coughing and um, you've been, to, we, you know, we would just want to make sure that, you know, you don't have the flu or COVID or anything like that. So I'm going to come back and I'm going to do that exam for you. And I just wanted to show you what, what I'm going to be wearing when I do that exam. So I am going to be putting on an N N95 and this is what that looks like. So I'm going to put it over my nose like that. And it looks kind of funny. So I just wanted to show you what it looks like because when I come back, this is what I'm going to be wearing. Okay. And I know you can't see me really good because my glasses are fogged up. But um, in order for me to do that exam, I need to wear all this stuff. So I just kind of wanted to show you what it looks like so you won't be um, surprised. And it might be a little bit difficult for you to listen to me. So um, when I come back and do that nasal swab, you know, you might be um, coughing some more or you might be um, sneezing. So I have to wear all this stuff. Okay, I'll see you later then. Thank you. I'll be back with your meds and I'll be back to do your nasal swab. Um, here's your call light, so let me know let us know if you need anything else, okay? Thank you. Okay, so you are the patient. How did you feel being a patient and somebody, a nurse talking to you with all these PPE on them? Anybody? In the chat, they say they felt like, who is this? Mm -hmm. So the, commu the communication wasn't that great. Yeah, who is this? They can't see my face. Okay, what else? Were you guys able to hear what I was saying? Hey, Montoya, did you want to say something? Yes, I, I wanted to say I, it just felt very impersonal. And I had no idea who you would be. I mean, you could have been anybody. I, there's no face. There's no recognition. Yeah, and I am wearing my badge, but it's not very visible in the video. It could but, be anybody, right? Yeah, it, but even the badge, there's no facial connection to the badge even. Yeah. Uh, there's more comments in the chat. Whoa, harder and harder to hear. So impersonal. I had trouble hearing and understanding the conversation was muffled. I felt disconnected, difficult to understand, made me feel nervous. <laughs> Dr. Kelly says her hearing is better than she thought. <laughs> um, well, when I first did the video, I was um, like with a mask. I was because I'm used to speaking loud because I have a lot of students in the classroom. So I was thinking, ah, I should redo it, but I didn't. I didn't redo it. So I was kind of speaking a little bit louder than usual. I'm just used to like you put PPE on and you automatically like speak a little bit louder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, then, so, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, there are a few more. Uh, someone said I was almost nervous about getting swabbed in the eye. Um, felt uh, felt sorry for the nurse. More focused on trying to understand the process and then processing the information that had to be said, and felt it was hard to concentrate and to understand. Okay, okay, those are all. That's that's exactly how our patients feel. You know, if they don't understand the information that's being said to them. Um, you know, they start being afraid. Um, you know, you were wearing all this stuff and they don't get to see our face. They don't know us, um, you know. So it's, it's really difficult for patients. 
But I just want to say also, um, you know, COVID was very hard for for nurses and all the people in healthcare too. And it was very stressful for all of them. Okay, next slide. Good morning. Hello. Oops, How are you? Sorry. I'm trying to go to the next slide. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so um, in communication, there's a sender and there's a receiver. And uh, we as nurses give the information, but many times the receiver does not understand the information given. So other factors to consider when we're communicating with our patients is background noise, um, the patient's condition, the alarms, the monitors, the TV, other people in the room, uh, people from lab walking in to get labs or people from, you know, um, x-ray trying to get your patient go, to go to an x-ray um, so there's a lot of commotion always going on so when I did that video I was trying to um, I did put a background noise but it wasn't loud enough so it was just kind of like an alarm beeping there's always a lot of commotion in the hospital so things to think about when we're like trying to communicate with our patient um, let's see what else so when we surveyed and asked the student nurses about their perception, if they thought that if their communication was effective, 21% uh, reported always, 63% uh, said usually, and 13% said sometimes. So um, not everybody was like checking themselves to see if they were communicating effectively with their patients. Um, so we have to be aware of how we're communicating with our patients and not just with our patients, but with everybody else. How are we communicating with our patients when, when we're wearing, we are wearing PPE? That's something that we need to think about. And then, um, so right now at the College of Nursing, we teach our students um, about communication. That's a concept that we teach. And we also teach our students about PPE, but we don't teach those two things together. And I think this is something that we need to look at because we need to make sure that we're teaching our, our nurses that they need to communicate effectively when they're wearing PPE. Um, so some of the things here, I put some helpful communication tools. So there's just some mnemonics, ABC is, um, you know, attend my mindfully to your patient. So pay attention to your patient, behave calmly, try not to be stressed out. Although sometimes there's a lot of commotion and, you know, so we have to try to talk to our patients calmly and then communicate clearly. And then ADET, I learned ADET actually when I was a nurse at UNM. So we have to acknowledge our patient. We wanna make sure that we introduce ourselves we want to tell them, explain to them what we're doing if we're doing a certain procedure. Um, and we, we want to tell them like, oh, this is going to take like 10 minutes or however long it's going to take. And then we have to remember to thank our patients. Um, let me see, what else did I want to say in this slide? <clears throat> so... Like I said, communication is very important. We have to check for understanding. When we're wearing PPE and talking to our patients, um, we have to make sure that we ask our patients, did you understand what I said? That way um, we are aware that we are communicating effectively. So in conclusion, wearing PPE hinders effective communication. Effective communication skills are vital when caring for patients. Communicating effectively while wearing PPE is important. We wanna make sure that our patients have positive um, outcomes. Um, the patients might misunderstand their um, medications. They might misunderstand their plan of care. They might misunderstand a lot of stuff. So we wanna make sure that we check for understanding and um, if we're wearing PPE, especially because, you know, that covers a lot of um, nonverbal communication. And I think that nursing school should, should implement communication skills while wearing PPE and also assess for their competence in, in their communication. So this is the end of my presentation.
Do you guys have any questions? Thank you so much, Jerry. We appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. If you guys have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat uh, or you can virtually raise your hand and we'll call on you. Dr. Kelly, do you have a question? Yes, I just wanted to uh, thank Jerry for her wonderful presentation. And I'm very proud of her work um, as a, a lecturer in a, a boots on the ground faculty member. She took on this research project in addition to her regular duties because she was so passionate about it. And she's been very successful with her dissemination in the College of Nursing. And we look forward to her manuscript when she gets some time to take a breather. Thank you again, Jerry, for all your hard work. I'm proud of you. You're welcome. We have a couple of comments in the chat. Uh, this was a great presentation. Thank you for presenting. Great work, Jerry. This should also be a competence for staff working in the healthcare organization. Um, do you work with the health literacy department? Um, they, they come to our lecture and they present on health literacy, so yes. So, uh, Jerry, this is, this is Carolyn. Are there really masks like that on this last picture? <laughs> I just wanted, I just, <laughs> yes, they are. Yes, yes I, I found them on the internet. They, I don't think they're like medically, you know, right. right. But I just like the smiling uh, person there. <laughs> yeah. Don't wear these masks in the hospital. Yeah, I didn't think I didn't think so. I don't think we have an N95s that allow have a clear plastic. So, yeah, there were some uh, non-medical uh, masks like that for people who are hard of hearing to help them um, with their whoever is with them. So I have seen them before out in public. Um, Jerry, we have another question. They were wondering if there's an additional ways to check for patient understanding that's not a yes or a no question. Yes, you have to, when you're talking to your patients, you can have them like repeat the information. Like you just told them, okay, you need to take two pills at uh, bedtime. So you can have them repeat that. And that's, that's how you can check for understanding. Um, aside from teach back, what other message can we do at the bedside to ensure the patient is understanding with education, explanation, and expectations? Um, so besides, so teach back is a big one. You know, the, the, you teach your patients about their medical plan of care, about their medications or about whatever. So they have to like tell you back, uh, but we can also provide them with pamphlets because they're going to forget. So if we provide them with like, um, uh, whatchamacallit, with pamphlets when they leave the hospital, then that's another form of communication. And they, come, they can go back to those pamphlets uh, for instructions on their medication or, you know, for their follow-up appointments or whatever they need. So, you know, verbal communication, yes, we can tell them, they can tell us back, but we also need to back it up with some other form of communication. I've, I forgot to mention too um, that in the hospital we have the the whiteboards. That's a, a good way of communication. So we can uh, update it every. We have to update it every day. That way the patients know what's going on, um, at what time they took their last pain med, or what procedures they're going to have that day. So that's another form of communication. Um, and then we were talking also about our badges. We need to make sure that you know they can see our badges. Um, and I was reading a couple of other papers too that, you know, when the nurses were fully uh, with their PPE, they would they had pictures of themselves in the whiteboard. That way, the patients could see could see who they were. Fantastic. Um, also, the challenge during COVID not only allowing visitors and so often educating. Oh, sorry, with a family member and support present is another set of eyes and ears. Um, there's a lot of great comments in the chat. 
Does anybody have any other questions? Well, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us. Again, we appreciate it. Do we have any other questions before we move on? Okay, if you haven't done so, please don't forget to sign in with your name and credentials in the chat. Also, please be sure to complete the survey in the chat by April 24th at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time to receive your CEs. And we have put that link in the chat just now. If we have not answered your questions, or if you wanna contact our presenters directly, their emails are on screen, and we're also putting those in the chat so you have them for you. And I wanna thank you all for attending the UNM College of Nursing Scholarship and Research Speaker Series. Be sure to visit our website for more information on our next lecture, which will be Wednesday, June 7th, on Veterans Health Administration's RN Transition to Practice Residency Program, addressing new graduate nurse retention and transition to practice, given by our College of Nursing's Associate Professor and Director of Center for Health Equity Preparedness, Dr. Mary Pat Kuig, and Acting Associate Director, RN Transition to Practice Residency Program, for the Office of Nursing Services for the Veterans Health Administration, Dr. Shelley Roth. We hope to see you there. Everyone have a great evening. <laughs>